Hi, everyone. Um, thank you all for coming today. It's really nice to be able to be here to talk a little bit about my work. Um, and I just want to thank everyone at the gallery, too, for making this all possible. It's really exciting to see all the work together. And um, I'm happy to be here. Forgive my nerves. I'm usually alone in the studio cutting paper. So uh, public speaking is not my forte. But, um, but I am happy to kind of, I, what I'd like to do is give a little background information on what I've been interested in for quite some time now, as far as themes that run through my work, and then talk a little bit about the work that you see in the gallery today. Um, so a little background on me. I grew up in Maine, uh, southern coastal Maine. Um, so I would say that uh, nature has had a pretty big effect on me since I was a little kid. My mom's side of the family are fishermen. My dad's side is uh, are stonemasons and quarrymen. So when I was not in the woods, I was in the water and vice versa. So. Um, being in the out in the natural world has always been important and I think has left a pretty big imprint on what I'm interested in artistically and how I actually go about making my work. I'll speak to that a little bit more later. Um, so that's sort of the main, uh, the first theme that I wanted to quickly touch, touch on is nature. Obviously, I think it's pretty clear um, the presence that the natural world takes in my work around you. Um, I'm particularly interested in um, collecting source material and imagery to influence this work from a time when um, sort of science and myth or science was sort of allowed to have a mythological component um, that uh, mythology and the mystical realm and science were kind of sisters of a sort um, that understanding the natural world incorporated both endeavors. Uh, so particularly, I collect a lot of imagery from um, sort of the early 1900s and earlier. Um, a lot of things, images like um, early naturalist drawings, Ernst Haeckel was a zoologist, oceanographer from the early 1900s that made these incredible um, drawings of oceanic life. Um, also images that were uh, illustrations of what was happening on the inside of the body as well as out at a time when there was actually no apparatus to see what was happening on the inside of the body. Unfortunately, I can't show you these images here today, but hopefully describing them kind of adds another layer to, um, that you can kind of think about when you look at my work. Uh, another thing, um, medieval bestiaries, that's just another example. It's sort of, I'm in a constant state of collecting images that are going to influence the imagery of the work and also the, the process and the concept. Um, the other interest, uh, major interest of mine, is language and text. Um, maybe that's not as immediately obvious as the natural element, but I think upon a closer perusal, you might get a sense of um, words manifesting themselves in strange ways and in strange places. Um, I want to talk a little bit about language because it's a major influence and it has been for uh, quite some time now. Um, it kind of came about in an unexpected way through an un unexpected person. Um, I was in a kind of transitional point in my work uh, trying to figure out what was coming next and I came across sort of a strange, um, strange person to be inspired by. That was Robert Smithson and I say he was a strange person to be inspired by because you can probably all uh, see that he really has nothing to do with the images that are in this room. Um, he was known for his uh, land art works primarily, but he also wrote a lot about language. Uh, particularly the thing that I kind of grappled onto was this idea of a language to be looked at and things to be read. He thought of language as this kind of infinitely rupturable, recyclable, recyclable, recyclable material. Um, that could be infinitely transformed, uh, that you could cut apart a word and turn it into something else. I think Smithson, we could probably all agree that he was a rebellious figure and he was rebelling quite often against the institution trying to bring art outside the museum or the gallery. He was also, I think, saw, he saw language as one such institution that deserved to be ruptured and changed. Um, so he became a kind of a, a guiding light, I guess. Um, and another person that I just want to briefly mention is Roland Barthes, um, the French thinker. Uh, he wrote, I'm particularly interested in his writings from the 1950s that dealt with 
the idea of language, again, as being infinitely transformable. Um, that language and text could be appreciated visually apart from its, uh, the notion that we read it in, in efforts to understand something or to communicate. That it could be something broken apart and appreciated purely on a visual level. Um, he's, I mean, he's sort of a big person to try to unpack in a 20 minute talk, so I'm not gonna do that, but I do wanna say that he's of great influence and um, this idea of trying to arrive at a text or a language that defies our expectations is something that's very important to me. Um, so those are the two kind of main threads that move through all this work and have moved through my work for quite some time now. Um, I sort of see myself in this work as, as some kind of scribe that through the, um, the ritual of transcription that some unknown meaning or raw experience of text and image can be arrived at or appreciated. Um, so the way that I started to use text um, was kind of inspired by surrealist automatic writing techniques. I just sit down and sort of draw patterns and write into them. There was no burden of making sense in my writing. It was purely just um, the process of putting words on a, on a page or on a drawing in this uh, example. Um, that sort of became kind of a little too mundane at some point for me. And, uh, and it felt a little too meaningless. And so I wanted to try to find text to sort of force a collaboration with. Um, so I've used um, uh, texts from authors such as Lewis Carroll, Jorge Borges, uh, Herman Melville, Walt Whitman. Um, I'll talk a little bit about the texts in this room today, uh, just in a little bit. But I want to say a few words about, um, you know, why I'm attracted to certain texts and certain authors. I've sort of been on the search for um, authors that I think are already incredibly playful with how they manipulate words. Carol, his words are often sort of relieved from the burden of making sense pretty quickly, which I appreciated. And I think that's sort of an interesting gesture for a writer to, to make. Um, Jorge Borges, it feels like you're sort of entering this loop of this one great story that's built out of hundreds of little stories that he writes. Um, Herman Melville, the way that he sort of talks about macroscopic themes and microscopic detail. I feel like all of the writers have a really, have created a really specific um, rhythm and way that you move through their text as a reader. And that's kind of what I'm interested in trying to channel with the authors that I select. I also pick authors that I want to read really slowly in the studio because it's a pretty uh, labor intensive process and I don't want to sort of collaborate with something that's not engaging just as a literary work in the first place. So that's kind of um, just a little bit about how I feel about writing and why certain authors. Um, and really what ends up sort of coming to be through that process is, is an effort to try to make pictures of words and they're not visualizations of content or meaning, um, but there's, there's sort of a new kind of visual incantation, at least, at least that's the way I think about it. Um, a critic once wrote, uh, I can't take credit for this, but I thought it was a really great um, way to describe what I do and he said that I was channeling a text psychic shape, wave, wavelength and rhythm, which I thought was kind of a nice sort of um, abstract way to describe my efforts. Um, so now I'll actually talk about what you're sitting amongst. Um, my current work is, it's really two bodies of work that I made um, concurrently uh, over my time in um, uh, Roswell, New Mexico. Um, when I first got to Roswell, uh, you know, I'm a New Englander by heart. I've been in Texas for a little while, but the landscape of Roswell was truly um, strange to me. The things that lived in it, the way that it looked. It's not exactly a desert, but you drive out of town and you're pretty much in kind of a desert. Um, but quickly, uh, you know, you think that nothing's there because there's really nowhere to hide in that kind of landscape. Uh, but then you realize that there's actually like a lot of life and strange things that live there, um, which I grew to know over my nine months. Um, so what I wanted to do was take some of that natural world, um, the strangeness of it, um, the things that were uh, that I did not grow up with um, or know very well at all, and try to incorpor incorporate some of those natural forms into my um, new work. So things like succulents, uh, cacti, 
um, the snake of uh, various, the skins of various snakes. Um, different patterns that I felt like were new to me. I wanted some, I wanted to sort of incorporate them somehow into a new body of work that felt like it was making effort to at least be a little bit more site specific to the landscape I was living in. Um, so I started to look at these different natural patterns. Um, the other thing that I knew that I wanted to do was make a body of work that was um, kind of paying homage to an artistic influence of mine. I hadn't done that in, intentionally in quite some time. I mean, our influences as artists work their way in organically, but I felt like making something directly responsive to an, an artist I find important in my life. So um, the Flowers for Henry series, which is in front of you here on this front wall, they're really um, uh, works that are paying homage to Henry Darger. Um, and I'll say a few words about him um, for those of you that don't know his work. He's, he's probably the most um, well-known outsider artist today. Um, he's no longer living. He died in, uh, I think, 72. Um, and what I mean by outsider is, it's a, I, again, that's another sort of complicated, heavy, uh, heavy baggage term, but I'm just going to use it as someone that didn't have formal art training. Um, he made all his work in Chicago in the 40s, 50s, 60s um, in his apartment. And it wasn't discovered till after his death when his landlord opened up his apartment to clean it out. They basically uncovered this treasure trove of work um, that had never been seen by anyone. Uh, so Darger, um, without going on too long about describing his work, I encourage you to look him up if you haven't looked at him before, um, made these incredibly um, beautiful, elaborate uh, watercolor pencil drawings, often six feet long on both sides of the page. Um, sort of scroll-like format um, of uh, sort of natural settings where his, narr his incredibly complicated narrative would unfold. He also read a lot of text that went along with his work that was basically the, the work was sort of an illustration of the text in, in a way. Um, and so I took, um, in addition to the images of southwestern flora and fauna, I also pulled images of his own flower blooms because he drew a lot of um, uh, gardens for his characters to sort of move through and play in. Uh, and then I also took pieces of his autobiogra autobiographical text. So in some of the work, there's words that are a little bit more on the forefront, and in others, the words have been completely buried by the natural imagery. And I like the kind of tension and the push and pull from making things that are identifiable as words and then things that maybe could look like some sort of hieroglyph, but you don't really, you can't really. Um, put meaning on it anymore because it's been abstracted to a certain level. Um, the other thing I want to say about this work, and then I'll speak about the other pieces behind you all, um, is that the, uh, they were also kind of inspired by this um, really lovely Victorian tradition of making um, mourning wreaths for, for people that died. Um, they were made out of uh, hand-cut paper flowers, and you'd make one after you lost a loved one, and it would be sort of a memorial object. So I was also kind of had those sort of rummaging around in the back of my brain as I was making these um, pieces. They felt like mourning wreaths for Darger, but happy mourning wreaths, not sort of um, dire ones. Uh, so that's kind of where this work sprang from. I know I'm sort of giving some information that, that is not readily uh, viewable upon first sight. Um, and that, I guess I, I do want to say briefly that um, I, I'm sort of just offering what's inspired me to create the work. But my hope is that the images are fluid enough that um, without knowing that information, that the viewer can bring their own set of associations to the work. Um, so that was sort of the, the first series of my Roswell time. The second one, which I want to briefly talk about, is the Book of Nature um, work, which you see um, sort of on the side and behind you. Um, these pieces kind of went in an opposing direction from the darger flowers or blooms. Um, instead of building things out of cut paper and through the process of great accumulation, I wanted to kind of go back to a more direct drawing process and sort of try to camouflage where I would cut. They actually still have cut paper embedded within them, but it's a lot, I think it's a lot harder to decipher where it's cut and where it's just drawn. Um, 
They're called the Book of Nature series because while I was out in Roswell, I started to get interested in, um, further interested in the idea of the Book of Nature. Um, basically, this, I mean, this idea goes back to antiquity and it's had various um, uh, iterations throughout history, but um, the basic idea is this metaphor of um, nature as a most elegant book, that if you paid attention and you looked around, you looked sort of out your, outside yourself into the world and paid attention that um, you could sort of read and interpret this book in order to come closer to the understanding of its creator, whoever you think that creator might be. Um, that part I like to keep open because, I mean, that's an entirely personal endeavor. But um, so I liked that notion of, of the idea of nature as a book. Um, it seemed to sort of be within the uh, theme of what I was already investigating in my own studio. Um, so I began to sort of take, um, again, found text as a starting point. So in this case, Emerson's essay um, from 1836 on nature, and also some Gary Snyder poems thrown in there for good measure from his um, backcountry collection. He was a 1960s poet that wrote a lot about the natural world. Um, I started with those texts as, as the sort of beginning point, and then was also kind of looking at patterns, um, uh, often a lot of um, natural textile patterns to sort of write within. So I'd draw out the pattern first and then write the text within it, and they'd kind of grow intuitively from there. Um, so the text and the pattern were the loose starting point, but then there's a lot of kind of improvisation that happens as the work um, is further unfolds. Um, so this was sort of, you know, like I said, a different direction from the Darger work. Um, what I wanted to do, instead of making more direct representations of things found in nature, like flowers or bushes or cacti, um, I wanted to sort of capture the feeling of nature, the uh, uh, never ceasing, never exhausted movement of nature, the fact that nature is always changing, it's never static. Um, so the hope was that the work would sort of feel as though it was in constant flux, sort of moving in front of your eyes and never being pinned down by being easily identifiable. Um, so, you know, pulling from um, patterns like the uh, outside of a shell, the skin of a snake, um, underwater sea life, sort of using that as a jumping off point, but then sort of allowing, trying to allow it to remain um, a little bit abstract and a little bit um, hard to identify, um, but still sort of enlivening it with a feeling of being moving and alive. Um, that was the sort of F, the, the intent um, behind those, those larger pieces. Um, what else did I want to say about that? Uh, I also like the idea of sort of if Emerson's text itself was put into motion, what would that look like? I mean, and that seems sort of a strange thing to say, but um, I like that idea of taking some uh, sort of a, a major text, a well-known text, and sort of trying to bring it back more to its primordial state. What if those words moved around on the page? What form could they take? How might that move across the page? Where would one viewer enter and one viewer leave? I mean, that's all kind of up to the, the viewers, and there's no right way to enter. There's no right way to read. Some of them are impossible to read. It's supposed to be a complicated experience. Um, so, and, and also an effort to sort of get to the idea that reading can be a complicated, frustrating experience as well. That, you know, whenever we read, it shouldn't always be about just reading to understand something. What if we tried to get to some new experience of reading? Um, what would that look like and what would that feel like? That was sort of, those were all the things that were kind of rolling around in my brain when I was making that work. Um, I'll say a few words about my process if there's time and then um, I'm happy to answer questions. Uh, I'm sure I've produced some, so. Um, as far as uh, process goes, I see drawing as a kind of um, sort of ever-growing process, and I try to have my own um, process of making also mimic the natural world, so sort of growing pieces, making and growing pieces of a cut paper, allowing them to accumulate, 
cutting something down from one thing and putting it up in another and sort of allowing the work to kind of cross-pollinate itself in the studio. So all the work is made at once and that's really important um, because you know one thing might be part of one piece for a while, it gets cut out and it migrates into another. That all happens pretty intuitively. I have these kind of patterns and images in my mind, but no direct plan for the final image that any one work will take. So it's important that they all be going at once um, so that they can kind of migrate that way. Um, there, in the past, I've, I've worked with kind of layers of cut paper that you sort of look through when the piece is finished. These works, when I was in Roswell, especially the Flowers for Henry series, I wanted to try to construct something a little bit that was sort of getting towards being more three-dimensional. So in this case, I tried to get the paper to come out a little bit more than go in, um, which was sort of a new, a new way of working. Um, there's a lot of improvisation that happens in the studio. A lot of it doesn't work. So that's also another reason to have a lot going on so that um, nothing is ever thrown away. If something doesn't work out, it can always sort of grow and become something much later on down the line. Um, I tend to work flat. Uh, things don't actually go up on the wall or vertical till the very last minute. I sort of like to sit on top of everything and sort of puzzle it out that way until I'm happy with um, the way an image has come together, then it'll go up on the wall. Um, but usually what I do is I sort of set up lots of um, random scraps of paper in my studio, draw out my patterns, write out my text, whichever text I've chosen to work with in that particular body of work, and then start the cutting. Um, so that's kind of how they come to be. Um, maybe I should stop there and take questions, <laughs> if anyone has any.